the idea for Roseblood was a, a crazy one. I always loved Friday the 13th Part 7. I always thought that they did it injustice with the kills and that and i always thought like well what happened after seven like what happened to tina and what happened to nick and i, don't feel, I feel like the story was never told so i'm like you know what what if i i like wrote a little short you know tell what happened to the story what happened to tina and i thought i was crazy i'm like whatever so then thank god i called um riley lorden and i'm like hey man i got this idea and he was just like you know i always love part seven i would love to do a fan film like that and then it just kind of started happening honestly almost expecting him to say no or you're crazy and that would have been the end of it there would have been no genesis i would have been like oh yeah you're right you know and would have went back but he's like nah man you could do it early on in that process was talking about he's like you know what i'm gonna do it i'm gonna i'm gonna make this movie let's make a part seven fan film and you asked me to direct it and i was like man i i don't think i should you know this is your baby this is your story it's what you want to do and it's your vision. Nobody else can make it really come to life other than you. So then I called Jason Brooks and they were shooting Vengeance 2. I asked Jason Brooks, I'm like, hey man, you think that I could use you and Sanaya and some of the people that already live out there to tell like a quick little story of, you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of um, Roseblood. And at first, you know, I was like, yeah, no problem. Let's do it. That sounds interesting. And then as we started talking about it, it kind of got bigger and bigger. He's like, dude, this is a full length movie. I'm like, it is? And he's like, yeah. Got so big, it kind of needed its own its own life and its own place. So um, we didn't want to wear out our crew by having everyone there for, you know, a week for, for Roseblood and then doing another week or two for, for Vengeance. So we kind of split those up and gave them space so that they could both, both breathe. I started putting it out there that we were doing the Indiegogo and we were raising money for this. And then a gentleman by the name of John Wood hit me up, who's friends with Laura Park Lincoln. So one day I'm just, you know, minding my own business in my kitchen, I chopping something. I don't know what I was doing. And I get a phone call and it was Peter. When I tried to get Laura Park Lincoln on board, I didn't even have a script ready for her. When Peter reached out with his first script, that was a little bit more in draft form. So that night I went and wrote her whole part out, um, her whole part with Dr. Cruz out. And then the next day I came back and sent it to her. And then she called me. And I loved it. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I might go on board for this. And I did. And that's how it happened. Literally, just like that. Laura was super ecstatic. She loved the script. She said it was one of the best. This is her words. She said it was one of the best scripts for a part eight that she's ever read. His script made sense to me. It also had the, the psychiatrist that's tormenting Tina. And it has... You know, where does Tina end up after she's taken away in that ambulance at the end of the show? She ends up, you know, in the middle of the hospital. And that's exactly where she was supposed to end up. So I was really excited about that. That had the flavor of what I wanted. Plus it had a whole nother element to it with um, with the character of Rose and, and then Jessica playing me in flashback, which was brilliant, really, really nice. So I loved all of that. And we went from there. And originally now that she was in the scene, it was supposed to be just her here. We were going to shoot um dr cruz who wouldn't have been terry kaiser from like the chest to the to the waist kind of thing and never really show him after i read the script i'm like you know i think we need terry kaiser in this she's like you got to call terry so i called terry and he answered the phone and he was in line at starbucks and so i was at the window while i was talking to this mr anthony whoever the hell he was and uh, uh, and so I parked the car and I said, now, what, what are you what are you doing? And I went on, I gave him like the elevator speech, you know, I went on and on about five, 10 minutes about how awesome it's going to be, what we're going to do, how we pay homage. And I have all the real items from the wall. And so the writing was wonderful because it, it, it and, I, and I felt so special because it was the beginning of the movie. It was introducing this new phenomenon. And then Kevin. Kevin was easier because once we had Lar and Terry, uh, Kevin was easier, but he, he was excited too. Peter got very excited about what he was offering. Um, I think his passion and I think his um, commitment to what he felt was um, a very personal project was definitely a reason of why I was intrigued. I, he told me he liked my energy and uh, we got him on, on board after that also. Early on in the, the life cycle of Roseblood, I was originally gonna be the director of photography and that ended up changing as Cody Newton was hired to take on that role. And I couldn't imagine it any other way. He's got this infectious personality on set 
that keeps everyone happy. He can take the script, he can take a story, he can take a concept, an idea, and then when he visualizes it and puts it on camera, he'll light the thing. Suddenly it's it's amazing and epic. I saw how he and Peter worked together um, to get like the just the right vision. So that was nice that they had that relationship because sometimes the DPs and the directors don't always jive. I've seen some ugly messes with that. I put that gentleman through the ringer. I mean, him having to deal with me for three, four months like that, even more is uh, a testament to his patience. So I think it's fair to say I did not know what I was getting into when I signed on with Peter. Friday the 13th Roseblood was slated to be filmed in nine days. And I've shot a feature film before um, and I've had my own feature films, but to shoot it in nine days was, is gonna be too way too crazy. <laughs> For me, this whole production was just chaotic on set because we had to cram so much into such a short amount of time. The days were long, the people worked hard, and I mean, everything that, that we did is an exact recipe for disaster, for um, aggression, for people, you know, either giving up or getting frustrated, um, arguments, none of that happened. The set was, was awesome. A lot of times you'll see people that are just working for a paycheck on a film set and nothing more. They don't care what's actually being created. On Roseblood, everybody cared and if if there was one man out that wasn't willing to put in the same effort as the guy next to him this film doesn't get done it was unbelievable how much passion everyone else had and it you know normally i'm not around people who have that much desire to do things or even just you know they felt lucky to be there and we had a lot of fans that were crew and that was fun because they liked the scenes they were having fun shooting the scenes so there were just a lot of things it made it a a really special experience and everyone knew we had this like mission you didn't really talk about it but it was there like, how are we gonna get these shots how are we gonna do this today we're falling behind and everybody just stepped up and got creative and and pulled their weight and more to do it and it was a family atmosphere there was a lot of different type of like personalities there too which was also really fun you know you have like some big stars like Lawrence, harry or kevin or interacting with the big three terry lar and kevin was amazing um each one of them in their own respect is just a powerhouse individual they've all done amazing things in their career and they could be super pretentious and super you know i'm over here and you're over here because they've earned it but not a single one of them was that way. The big thing was they were so humble and they were so kind about doing everything. It, it's hard to even explain as a horror fan, especially as a Friday fan, how incredible that experience was. Just seeing them in the room is one thing, but seeing when you hear action and seeing them and being there, you're actually in the room, you're not watching it in your living room, was incredible and it just took me back i was like you guys are nailing these characters it's like these are it's like it, obviously it's you two it just came right out for them and just getting them seeing them work you know on a professional level and not just like you know not just seeing them on screen it was it was a nice little take and you know that they're very talented people lar gave us a 12-hour day that day and she worked so hard and she did so much and at the very end she did a, a fight scene and it was so much fun to do. Took me a little bit of time and all of a sudden I realized, holy shit, I will be Lars Jason in this thing. And not only did we love shooting it, not only did the fans want to see that, but man, Lar enjoyed every single second of it. I had this wonderful scene with, with Jason, but we were still in that very, very small room, but it was really fun. Uh, it was, surreal in a lot of ways but i think we accomplished in that small room a very similar feeling to being in the basement in part seven with the you know all the things that, that tina was throwing at him and i think we got close to that feeling because of the confinement it doesn't even feel real until you're actually looking at them and they're there and uh putting together recreating the character for the first time in 30 years and especially that first time seeing Law and Terry shoot together. The big thing with Terry is watching his performance come out because, I mean, I had read the script, but I didn't really understand what the essence of the script was until Terry walked on set and he started to deliver some of those lines. And we started doing, I said, do you, do you mind if at the end of this scene and something like this, that I literally yell something, this last line? Tina, Tina, Tina! He, he's like this big and he's like that wide. <laughs>
And man, when he turns it on, he is a scary dude. Like he just goes from zero to 11 with that intensity of Dr. Cruz. Oh my God, he, he he's he's amazing. That guy is, un he's like the Energizer Bunny. Thankfully, Peter, as a director, was not worried about his script changing at all. He was trusted the actors that were put in front of him and he allowed them to go in and improv some of those things and it worked. You know, Terry screaming at Lar and that transition to young Tina doesn't happen if Peter was not willing to let Terry improv and take that over because that was Terry's idea to scream like that. Everybody on the set, <laughs> they jumped. They jumped when I screamed this thing. I even jumped a little bit, I think. We all had chills, I feel like, every time that Terry did any line like it was just amazing his voice carries in a certain way but the opening scene with terry was awesome because the room had been made exactly like it was when we shot it and i got the real poster the real painting poster of the 20th century train and then the real plaques and awards and the real it was a challenger shuttle and peter and his attention to detail is beyond like that i can even comprehend like it, it is absurd the amount of effort he put in to just sneak in easter eggs that i would be willing to bet nobody noticed i don't even know how peter even found or figured out how to get all this stuff there i mean everything you know he's got stuff that was identical from part seven and then the weapons like on the wall it was just it i was i, I think everyone was shocked you gotta remember you can't go back and buy an older one because it's yellow and it looks old you have to buy one that was never opened which is incredibly expensive the props that peter pulled together were amazing they were literally like going back in time i don't really even know how he pulled a lot of it off what do you even google to find that notebook that dr cruz is using in part seven the book we got the green record book which took me forever to find online and then i started looking on the walls behind me and all these mental, uh, the, the things that were in the first original movie he had on the set. I said, Peter, where where, where did you get these? He says, I know, I know. And how do you know all these things? And he says, because, because I just studied it. I love I love this movie. I love, I love what it's about. I might not have even noticed them in the room filming 30 years before, but Peter had found all of these little pieces to put that room that Tina's seen in her mind back together. And it was really awesome. So the strangest feeling. I wanted it to feel personal in the 80s and from and add in my little touches of what I loved and grew up with. That's elegance. That's when you that's when you start looking around and you see stuff that isn't just there. But it but it has a meaning. It has a depth. And what that does is gives a picture. And I think this is where Mr. Anthony directed the thing with that depth of elegance. And for the first time out, he did okay. <laughs> you know, it's, it's Peter's first time, it's his directorial debut. He's never done this before. He's never made a movie before. He's never had this much responsibility on a movie before. He's helped with some other things, been a part of other things, but this is the full, full thing, the full meal deal um, all at once. This movie he did, I can't believe that it was honestly his first movie. It was like being with a, a seasoned director. Um, it was, I mean, it was incredible. First time being a director, it just did so amazing. Like, I don't think as an actor, I would have been able to do quite as good of a job without him being there because he just has such a amazing, like creative vision that I don't think anyone else really possesses. One look together, then back, then there. I know that even Lar and uh, Terry, Kevin, um, and all that, they, they all, have complimented him on how he performed as a director in this. You would think that he had directed a lot of projects from this. You know, he, he was solid in every single piece of his direction and making it work. And I know the work involved in that. And I know the spirit that you have to have, the dedication you have to have. He got it. The man's got it. And Peter Anthony was totally professional on set. I mean, literally, if you needed something, he was there for you. He helped you out. Peter's a great dude. You know, he's always, he takes, if you take care of him, he'll take care of you above and beyond the good thing is on set he was very humble he was open to so many different ideas and i think that really helped all of us to chip in and all of us to be excited because we were all brainstorming trying to figure out some of the best ways to film this movie his humbleness of how he thanked and appreciated everybody was above and beyond all that you know most people that know him 
that aren't as close to him, if they could see that side of him, um, it, it, is, it is truly remarkable. From what I've heard, no one's been so lucky as to get like a crew together, make a movie in eight days, let alone your first movie. It's just, you know, it's unheard of. He found people who had the same type of passion as him, who were very capable of helping him carry the film. So that has a lot to be said about him too. He found definitely the right people to be able to share that with him. This for him was not just, I made a fan film. It was something that I took away from the attention that he put into it is, I made something that could be part of the actual film legacy. Really, I think his leadership really blew my mind with just the way he was able to tackle so many different jobs that we needed. You know, he, he was just going nonstop on this thing, like balls to the wall, and I've never seen anybody do that on a movie set. Producing, doing production design, props, all of these different things, writing, directing, and acting at the same time. I know that he thinks that he can do everything, but that is very hard for one person to do. And if you watch the movie, you can't tell. You can't tell that he has, I mean, even during his performance, you know, there's a million different things that are weighing on Peter Anthony. So he's really at the center of it all. All the details, all the cool things from the 80s. That was his passion and making sure everything was done right. And so his sort of no-nonsense demeanor like works amazingly in the role of the director. Peter is really balls into this and just passionate and wants it to be the best. And so, you know what, we're gonna bust our ass and be the best too. And when you see a guy working that hard on something, it motivates somebody else to work that hard for that person who's, who's you know, on the same, same boat as him. We all have to pull our weight, right? And um, I don't think anybody lacked effort on their part, so. Um, and that all starts with the captain. So Peter is the captain. Frankly, it was surprising how much that he did for this film. And it really was, was fueled by this passion to create, this passion to make something that he was proud of, that he would love to show his family, that his family would be proud of. He just works harder than anybody I've ever met and really is not afraid to just uh, attempt the impossible and exceed doing it. I have never seen anyone work harder and I work really fucking hard sometimes, but this dude, he just didn't stop. He just, he just didn't stop till he got his goal across. He wrote a great script. He directed a great movie. He was approachable. He wasn't rude. He, he was nice to everybody on set. It is a set and it is a movie that all of us will always remember and in a way, we're going to want to emulate exactly what we did on Roseblood so that we can capture that magic again. Probably for me, that was the best set I've ever worked on. When I first showed up, I was I was like odd as I walked up and there's this massive set. I was like, shit, a huge warehouse barn set up inside with all the walls and all that. Everything was already said and done in like the fast team room and some, there was like three other rooms right outside the hallway there. And I've been on major SAG commercial studio lots. I've been in some major projects and it felt the same, but the difference was Sean Lotus family. People can live a hundred lifetimes and not meet someone like Sean and his family. So I am beyond grateful to have met him. And let's not, let's talk about his skill set building. I mean, my God, he builds that set. And to meet Sean, I said, well, where did this studio company said, well, I built it. The real angels of the film were the Lutzes family. Not only were we filming on their compound, uh, not only did they build the building that we, we filmed in, but... We had a heated tent outside, we had a guest house, we had the main shoot house, um, and we served, we were served food from Tammy uh, all day, every day, and fresh food, you know, better than most people eat every day. I promise you, there was never a better food service on a film set than rose blood because every single meal was catered by tammy it was like going to a very nice restaurant every meal that was set up she cooked every day all day for eight days straight i mean non-stop for people that she didn't know and that makes everybody very happy and then they go back after lunch and they're happy to work some more everyone was taken care of the reason we were a well-oiled machine is because we had meal breaks and we had 
wonderful food. The guest house was completely full of people and it was like a party in there. And the way that Cody was, you know, displaying dailies from the, the day before and stuff and just like cheering on basically the work that we have done. Literally for the three days I was there, it felt like I basically was adopted by another family for just a few days. You really felt like home when you showed up. Everything you needed, anything that you needed was right there at any time that you needed it. They were always there. They were always so giving. They were always so, uh, I mean, they were like the parents of the film. Whenever you needed, they were there. You know, from anyone who had a smaller role to a bigger role, they treated everyone the same. Really did feel like that we were a family and that uh, they were taking care of us as such. They don't have to do that. And they do. And they want to do it. And they love it. Their kindness and their attention to detail and to warmth and to uh, in inviting you in. You really don't think a family like that exists until you meet this family. It's very rare that you find people so humble and so amazing that just step back into the shadows. You'll never see them take credit on social media for what, what they've done and the sacrifices they've made. One, it's amazing what Sean and his wife do for his daughter. I mean, I'm a single dad and uh, I struggle a lot to like take care of my son and do things. And I, and I watch what he does for his daughter and it's amazing, you know? They are such a team. Sean and Tammy, like they uh, really build each other up and that pours out to the people around them. They were an integral part of the success of this movie because they cared. And to see their relationship and how they worked together and how they respected each other, well, the word elegant comes back again. You know, I really appreciate them and everything they did for us and uh, it meant a lot, I'm sure, to everybody else on set. And um, it just shows also the kind of, uh, people that they are, you know? We need more people like that in the world. It's unbelievable to me that they would give so much um, to these ragtag little dreamers and bring them into their home and and have them take over everything and, and, and tell stories with them. I mean, the amount of, of space that they have in their heart for people like me, like people like Peter, people like Jason and, and all of us, it, it just astounds me. I, I thank them for everything, not only just with Roseblood, but uh, supporting me and my young career in the industry too, so. It's one of those things you keep saying it, you don't have the movie without them. There's no Vengeance 1, there's no Vengeance 2, there's no Roseblood, there's no Fall of Camp Blood without Sean Lutz and the Lutz's family. So we all should say thank you to them. Even though Jason is only in the movie for that last third, there are plenty of kills to choose from. So when I talk to most fans, most of them like the bullet kill. The, the weed whacker through the stomach and the bullet dropping, that was phenomenal. The Sanchez kill was awesome. Uh, when Peter had said, hey, uh, we're, we're bringing back a kill from part seven, only we're going to show the good shit on it. And I believe that was supposed to be in the original part seven, and it was too considered gory, so they cut it out. It, it's the most expensive scene in all of the film. Jason Brooks, of course, he did the uh, body casting. And Peter was like, we need the body. And so I was like, oh, I can do that, you know, fine. And then so we got Kelly, the actress, she came up here, flew up, and we did a body cast on her. From my neck down to my thighs that I had to get casted in order for it to look really realistic. As we were body casting her, you know, we kept checking in. And she just got the plane recently and I'm like, you're sure you want to do it right now? Uh, make sure you drink water. And she's like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm great. I guess I got too hot, um, too claustrophobic, 
and I actually passed out. You doing okay? She's like, oh yeah, I'm great. Oh wait, no, maybe I need to sit down. You know, normally when you get hot, you can sweat and you know, your pores are free. But when you're being um, casted, all of that, all of your pores, everything is restricted. Yeah, we got it finished. We got the body made um, out of silicone. We put inside, I did different layers of silicone and foam to be muscle and tissue and and left the, the cavity inside so we could fill it with guts. Getting it all set up, it was a pain. Uh, filling the body up with the fake blood and everything so that it would actually bleed when cut. And the funny thing is it didn't work out anything like we wanted it to. We hung the body up from the, from the ceiling. We anchored it on the bottom too, because we knew that if we hit it with the weed eater, it was going to spin. So we anchored it so it wouldn't move. If you started to put the weed eater into the body, it would just skip. You're thinking, this thing cuts down trees and shit. How the fuck? It bounced off her. The thing was packed with guts. It was ready to just like explode. But all we got was rain, rain, rain. Rain, it kept bouncing off for a, a whole bunch of times. And you can imagine, I'm just sitting there as a director, like, I can't believe that this is happening. I had to go through several times getting that thing cut. And uh, there was a couple fun shots with guts flying and intestines wrapping around and throwing. But um, I think the best of what we could get was what ended up in the film. That being said, the, the shot at the very end, Ryan Race got below this big plexiglass. I think he's down there for like two hours in the cold. Basically, I'm underneath the shed. I'm laying on the dirt. They have a blanket for me, you know, and, and of course the heebie-jeebies are kicking in because it's like two in the morning and I'm like freaking out, like wondering what's going on. I just had to put some headphones in and just start jamming. I mean, it was freezing. Jason's in his costume. It's that point where you see like the steam coming off of everybody, like, cause they're hot and it's cold out. And you got Kelly sitting there holding her guts Sanchez, and then she lets her guts go, and bink, the bullet falls out. Um, and then we all tried with the bullet. You know, you had to get that bullet just right in the right spot. And once the guts fall in the blood, there's only a couple spots that there's not blood on the plexiglass. So now you've got to drop the bullet. And uh, it would bounce and be out of focus, or it bounced in the wrong place. You couldn't really see it, tell what it was. And you got to have it land in a spot that the camera can see that's not concealed by blood from underneath. And then finally, I got lucky. On the last one and just kind of threw it and tink but that is such a memorable scene and such i mean that one stacks up with any of the kills it was finally the weed eater scene it's not the one i wanted but it was a way better scene and weed eater scene for the fans of part seven that they deserve Brent's kill when he gets stabbed through the wall and pulled through the wall, that was just awesome. It felt like very Friday the 13th and that kill itself just, it was so well done. I mean, it was a, a perfect kill. I think Brent's death in the movie is something to remember being stabbed with, I don't even know what that thing is, that big ass blade that looks like a hockey stick. It's called like 20 different things, but a sickle scythe is one of the things that it's called. So I loved shooting that scene. We, there, I mean, it, there were so many different levels to it. There was him, you know, reacting to being alone, him on the other side of the door, the closets. And, I mean, Sean had built a wall and like a closet area. Which Sean Lucas did such a phenomenal job. He built a half wall inside of a half room with a half closet so that we could take the camera and go from one side to the other. Peter had never shown me the, the scene from part seven when she was in the closet. Maddie from part seven, when she loses her earrings, goes into like that kind of barn shack thing and it's it's a storm out and it's like blue light storming. And I always love that light and scene with, with Jason because it's there's not too much stalking in seven, but in that part, he's like stalking her. It's like a build up and it's scary. And she's behind the wall. And then Jason's on the other side of the wall, like looking in and you don't know if he knows she's there. and so on and so forth. So we tried to like recreate that. I arrived on set the first day, you know, got to meet everyone, do a little bit of work, met Lara Park Lincoln. And then it was like, okay, well, since you're here and everyone that is required is here, we're gonna go ahead and do your uh, kill scene. The sickle scythe was uh, welded onto a sheet of metal and strapped to Brent. And that's how you get that awesome shot of Jason uh, with the blue storm light through the wall with Brent, ah, with the sickle side through him and the Amos effects had all the tubes running and blood shooting out everywhere. We're underneath of him staring up, pumping blood. I mean, it was spraying all over both of us underneath of him. Then we have Jason breaking through the drywall or the wall. And what Sean had done is on the backside, 
We had mapped out where, like outline of Brent was gonna be. We had to measure where Brent was on that wall. So you had to go, okay, his right shoulder is 18 inches off the wall. And then it ends at, you know, 42 inches off. His head is 18 inches in at six foot four inches tall. And we had to guess with those measurements. And on the other side, where Jason Brooks is in the dark, in the blue light, draw Brent. You know, I'm already kind of blind in this in this costume with the mask and then the hockey mask on. And I'm gonna have to push my head through the wall, through this drywall, and then punch my my hand through the drywall on the other side, grab him, pull him through. They said, are you willing to do this? I said, heck yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a construction worker. I, I deal with stuff all the time, you know, I'm, I'm a very tough body. So I, I had no worries about Jason pulling me through the wall. And at this point, I had not done anything like that before. I've never punched through drywall, um, let alone put my head through drywall. When Jason headbutts the wall, his entire mask moves and you could see his face. So we had to CGI that. So I don't know how Ryan Siblinski did that. Him breaking the wall, we added that little dust falling down, electrical breaking and everything. That's not even in there. And we had to hide and redraw his teeth with CGI so you couldn't see that his mask moved. I didn't feel like I went through the wall as much as I wanted to in that moment. So then from that point, everything else I did had to be even more. And so every move from that point, I wanted to amp up just a little bit more. So head through, the punch even harder, and then grabbing him harder and then pulling him back. Absolutely ripping him, man. Through that wall so violent in front of all of us. It was amazing. He just ripped him through the drywall. He just took him back, and I don't even think Jason thought a, a second time about it. And so as I pull him back, and you can probably kind of see it when you watch it, but I'm trying to hold him against my body, and then against um, as he gets lower, sliding down, so he's sliding against my thigh as well, so he doesn't just fall back on his head. The land was safe, you know, everything was good about it. I, he did pull me, but I had basically all my weight pressed up against that wall, so that when he just pulled me a little bit with the scored back, I just, like fell right through is way more controlled than you would think but at one point once he's down by my leg and then out of sight and i'm stepping over i'm blind to him i don't know where he is i'm hoping i don't step on i want to walk through and i knew we only had one chance at it so you know first night of acting my kill like one chance at this it was it was crazy i think it worked out like it, i really kind of look like in pain and once i get to the other side and they call cut. All I hear are cheers and gasps and oh my God, that was insane. And it was like we had just seen a magic trick, man. It, it was like magic exists and it was in the form of Jason in this first kill. And it was like, okay, this movie is gonna be something special and we get to be a part of it. And when everybody votes, that's in the top three, if not people's number one uh, of kills of Rosebud. The strang kill, the degloving, that was that was brilliant by Peter to come up with. John Strang with his kill. You know, he gets gets his hand ripped off. The hand rip was a tricky one. We uh took a few takes with that because it was it was two people. I had, you know, the, the slime on the hand and I was touching the hand, so the thing was very sticky, so it was just a trick to just throw it on its own. The hand flying on the ground and how real it looked, it was it was unbelievable. You know, just the battle of uh, whacking him with the briefcase, uh, the, the impact that he took on with me hitting him with that thing multiple times was just uh, a lot of uh, respect to him for taking that impact. Jason fractured his bone and his arm on one of those takes. We did not find out until the next day that he was hurting or that he had fractured his arm. So that says a lot about Jason's uh, dedication to his craft. 
having that thing ripped off my hands and that mechanical arm. I mean, when I saw that thing, I was like, are you freaking kidding me? That's my, that's my little bony fingers, you know? I never really made an animatronic or a mechanical prop that had that much movement in it. When I read it in the script, I was like, oh, how are we going to do this? I just imagine I'm sitting here saying that, but I don't know how the hell we're going to do that. It was a pain. I went through, I don't know how many hours I sat out in that shop. I, I don't think I slept for two days just staring at this thing and uh, getting it figured out. It's like a block of wood with like a skeleton hand on it with all these tendons and shit through it and then wires inside the knuckles and fingers with these holders on the bottom so you could pull pinky thumb whatever whatever you pulled is what it would move and i was like holy shit from that moment when he rips the hand off the hand looks so real but the best it's probably the best part of the film is john strang becoming just a little girl without a hand <laughs> Dude, him screaming <laughs> was so great ah! You know, I wish I had a chance to perfect that scream a little bit better. Um, you know, like I scream like a little giddy, like a schoolgirl. I, I wanted um, trying to get hit with the, the suitcase, the, uh, the briefcase. I had to um, play my own stunt double uh, and get thrown into the wall, um, you know, after getting hit with the briefcase. I think Peter w w made him do that five times we had a problem i mean me and him were almost getting into a fight about it because he's a wrestler you know he knows or he's not a wrestler but he's a fan of wrestling he knows what's up and he wasn't selling it but uh you know after like take 35 and peter anthony's disappointment in me because i didn't know how to throw myself into the wall properly <laughs> and then finally the last take his head it hits the wall it like bounces and he just he's down he went fucking head first hard into the wall slid down hit the concrete and then he's like, is that what you wanted? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but I will say when you watch the final thing and you see that I did, I look like a natural. So you wouldn't know that it took me 35 times to do that and a bruise of the shoulder. And then Brooks were like, we have to explode his head with the suitcase. I'm in the back uh, taking pictures and there's a bunch of watermelons and they're making this like slush stuff to go in the watermelons. Little did I know that that was going to be Strang's head that they were smashing to get the guts to shoot up. Uh, ultra slime and watermelons. And when you hit it with something, it just, you see it on screen. There's like blood and guts and ooze and shit flying everywhere. It looks like his skull's breaking, but it's actually just a watermelon. Brooke showed me the trick of taping some watermelons together, putting some blood and some slime in them. And I had no idea it was going to work out so well when he slammed that thing, those things exploded. And he takes the case and goes, bam, bam, bam. The head smashing in part was so cool. Like the chunks of watermelon flying up. It looked real. It looked disgusting. It's probably number two on my list. Joe Caban's face rip kill. I got to be honest, my favorite kill in the movie. And man, that's tough because there's so many great ones. The coolest scene in the entire film. I mean, hands down. And I can't believe it worked the way it did. Bringing uh, Joe in to the prop shop and getting to mold his face on set. They did a full cast of my face. Um, they just lie you down and they put this green stuff on your face and they let it set. It felt like it was 10 hours, but they told me it was 45 minutes. And man, they, they put that on his face and we realize that when you pull it off, he's, Joe has a big beard. You can't exactly, you know, apply a skin face like that to somebody who has a beard. And I'm just like, this is a problem. What are we going to do? We didn't think about this. And then Joe's like, I'll shave it. I'm like, you shave it? Well, you want want to shave it? it? He's going well, to have, gonna have these sponges. Gonna, and then, 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 then right yeah, yeah, we can go it. down. Let's shave it. I'll let you raise it right next door. It'll be better, dude. Yeah. 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 yeah! That's what I'm talking about, baby face Santana! How long has he had that beard? Probably 15 years, had to shave his face for the first time in over a decade. So I go into um, Pete's bathroom and he gets me his big clippers and we're shaving my beard off and um, they slap the rest of the red goo on. Jason Brooks had actually shown me something that I hadn't heard of before called a uh, ultra slime. That stuff is disgusting. Jason Brooks is saying what when I rip the face off, 
I want to press the face against the door so the Duke sees it. I really like the idea of looking through this window and then um, ripping the face off, but then showing it to him. And the way the eyelash it hits like right against that piece of the glass and the way it slides down was phenomenal. Q's screaming on the background. It's easy to get start crying because you hear him. I think I literally lose my voice on that take, my voice was gone. It was shot. I could I could barely talk, and I still had scenes to do. And then you just hit the floor and stop breathing, and that was it. For as much as you want to say, he seems to be the most innocent character in the film. So to see him have a connection with Duke, and that is built up over time, and to see the Duke react to it in such a way, I got better as the Duke as the days went on. You know, like it became less of a character I was just trying to play, and it became part of me. You know, I ended up crying because of how the Duke was reacting to it, so that really hit me. It hurts to see him cry and scream out to Jason. It was like Jason doesn't talk, but that was his way of saying "f you" to the Duke. Not only did I take your friend, but here's his face on the on the window is such a great moment to me. That's why it's my favorite kill. Kill him! No! Kill him! You piece of shit! No! When I get out of here, you gotta remember me! You hear me? You gotta remember me! Premiere wasn't like your standard movie premiere. Um, it was set up in a, one of Connecticut's premier banquet halls. A really nice place, the Woodwinds. It's a wedding event center. And it was beautiful. And you know, usually you go to a premiere and it's at a theater or something and everybody goes to a bar and says hello, whatever. But, but they had actually put together an entire day for this premiere. First of all, it was great just seeing everyone again and uh, not in you know, such a rushed kind of setting, you know, we were all able to just kind of be nonchalant and chill and talk and... But it was this moment in time where we all came together as a family, reunited, and we got to just sort of celebrate and reflect on the work that had been done and this amazing uh, movie that had come out of it. I don't think anyone has done anything like this for a fan film. And it was just incredible to see everyone together in the same room. Yeah, it was almost like a little miniature convention uh, for for Roseblood, we had all the actors there with our tables, um, signing things, set up, uh, meeting the fans. It was like it was catered beautifully, um, and just a great time leading up to the the moment where we all get to watch the film completed for the first time. My favorite part of filmmaking is when you get to sit back with an audience and actually experience all of your hard work and see it with them. It's always nerve wracking though to be in a room of fans that are about to watch. For the first time, it was the world premiere, the show, and hope it goes smoothly and hope they like it. And all of a sudden the lights are dimming and the movie's about to start and all these people are sitting there. My heart starts racing. I'm like, oh gosh, that's right. Like <laughs> I have to watch myself now and see how this whole thing turned out. And I was just blown away. Like I had chills immediately. I had little tears immediately. Just hearing the crowd's initial reaction to everything was a lot of fun. And seeing just how it all came together with everyone's hard work was a lot of fun. And People laughing at the parts they're supposed to laugh at. People cringing at the parts they're supposed to cringe at. People gasping, you know. By the end of the film, I had tears in my eyes because at each kill, hearing the people cheer about it and just the whole audience go nuts each kill. And it was like, man, seeing people's reaction to our work, it was, uh, it was surreal. It was incredible to be a part of. When I watched the premiere and I watched that film that's an hour and 30 minutes long and I seen exactly how it was put together and I seen that vision come through like I did. It is now part eight. I think Rose Blood is the official Friday the 13th part eight film. And at the end, everybody stood up and applauded, yay, oh, wow, wow, wow. The place just erupted with applause and a standing ovation. People just absolutely loved it. And I had to tell Pete, like, Pete, yo, <laughs> you got a, you got a standing ovation here. She quit bro and be like, hey, Pete, man, stand up. They're standing for you, you know? And so then 
I stood up and we all kind of embraced. And then there's, I'm pretty sure there's a picture of me looking at Sean and Sean looking at me and man, I, it's almost like being, you know, in a football team or like a, an army together where you went through like a war, you know, and he looked at me, I looked at him and we put our arms out. It was like, we didn't even say anything, but we did it, man. We did it. And then he hugged me and I hugged him and it was a special moment that I don't think any one of us will ever forget. This fan film, Roseblood, is incredible. I feel like every character was there for a purpose. Peter Anthony directed this movie as if he's been doing this for years. You made a phenomenal fan film. As soon as Jason showed up, it gave me chills. It took a while to like actually see Jason, but when we did, this film delivered. So bloody, so brutal. Some of the illest fucking craziest Jason kills you'll ever see. We're finally gonna get an actual death scene with this thing. Where I almost went, <laughs> all hail breaks through. It kept hitting you, pedal to the metal, balls to the wall. Yes. It's so good. This fan film is on fire in every way possible. Holy shit! Oh, no way! She's bringing Michael Myers back. What the fuck? No, they fucking didn't. What? Myers? What? 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 Fan reactions have been amazing. The fan reactions has been overwhelming to the film. It's unbelievable how many people have come out of the woodwork to be able to watch this movie, show their reactions, and and see how they're reacting to our work. They were more excited than I, I think we were. Obviously, we do this movie for the fans, and so when you, when you get to watch them react to these things, that's that's just makes it all worthwhile. How much people are actually accepting of it being a fan film, and they almost dub it in as an actual Friday franchise film. I don't think that there's another movie series that has a fan base like the Friday the 13th uh, fan base. It's just incredible. You know, some of these Friday the 13th fans who are so protective of the franchise and so you know, don't don't you mess with it too much and just to see how happy they are. They really love and adore this like franchise and it just felt really good to be able to do them proud. Whenever I make a film, I never get to see this type of, of love for a character or this type of love for a movie. And man, it, it feels so good. You know, you don't know what to expect because in your mind you made it and you like it and you have this bias, right? But you always have that fear too that people are not gonna like it. If the fans are happy, then you've done your job. So, I mean, we're obviously not making this movie to win Oscars or whatever. You see all the comments, people sharing it on social media, doing reviews. Uh, one, I'm just grateful for those people that are willing to take the time to do that and sit down and watch a feature length fan film. Uh, that in and of itself is a chore. So, to do it and enjoy it and share it and continue to support it, it's humbling and it's just amazing to see fans supporting fans. I feel very lucky that this is garnering so many views and that so many people are reaching out and saying they love it. It's so exciting and it's so um, fulfilling to know that people not only just watched it once, but they went back and watched it two, three more times. And they're saying, you know, each time I watch it, I find more things, I find more nostalgia, I find more hints. I see that you teased Michael out all these times before that and I missed it the first time or two. As an artist, a creator, how special that is for everybody to see like what we did, uh, reaction on these true fans, you know, true fans of the series. We've worked so hard on this thing to, to make sure that the vision came out, like the soul of the film came out correctly, but we we get to see the reactions of it and, and there's nothing like it. It's just, it's, just, it's amazing to see these people's reaction. They really genuinely love this movie and to be a part of something like this, I mean, I, I I feel like, you know, I won the lottery. It's 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 crazy. Roseblood will always hold a special place in my heart. I love this film. I'm super proud of what we created. I'm super proud of everybody, cast, crew, fans, people that backed this film. And to the fans that are watching this and, and see this, thank you for loving this franchise as much as we love the franchise. It was just completely magical. And thank you again to all the fans for watching it. It was so amazing. And I'm so glad that you all loved it. All my appreciation to the fans and the casting crew and everyone that, that came together to make this possible. So thank you so much for making all of our dreams come true. Thank you for supporting me and believing in me and being there for me. 
with Bryson and things I've gone through in my life and loss. I really, really, really appreciate it. Thank you, all you fans. Chester, Louis, Mickey Myers. Chester, you're a hardship to find. I, I am hard. Ooh. Hey, don't, don't ever let me go again. Please. Uh, all right. Do you have a kiss? Uh, uh, yes. Uh, hey. No. <coughs> you choking on your beard, <laughs> Yeah, me too. Is that Wait. steak? Mm. Yeah, pork, probably. Pork, pork chops, pork loin, pork rib. Wasn't Tina around here or somewhere? No, no. I think we're going to find Tina. Tina. Uh, wait, 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 Louie, don't leave. Louie, please. I, I mean, so much crippling debt, please. I need you, buddy. Check please. out the size of this fucking glory hole. you have a big enough pussy for that move. Scared your wife will get a taste of the Duke. Then she'll see who the big man really is. Dude, honestly, had you been here, it's probably gonna be the best Friday 13 fan film ever, all time, no doubt. Really. It's pretty cool, man. I mean, it's probably gonna be like the second best fan film ever, you know? What? Jeez, the Brooks guy got some fucking hot shit going on down the lake over there. Second I mean, best. Got this jalopy setup that you got second here. Best. Yeah, second hey, best. Hey, that's cool, man. That's anyway, cool. I got to get back to the Hey, hey, look, different. dude, someone so wants you real quick. You didn't go down. Oh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Joint cleaning this shit. 